man. Let me yeah, pop this up. Just take a second. First, I want to thank everyone uh, for letting me uh, talk today. I was going to talk earlier in the month, but I, I couldn't make it. And uh, actually, the extra few weeks has given me uh, some new time to think about certain things. And EarthCube is uh, is moving right along um, in in its uh, in its current form. So there's some uh, some good news, and uh, I, I want to talk about that too. But I also want to say that uh, anyone on the call uh, is, is welcome to join EarthCube and be a member of EarthCube. And uh, you can go to the EarthCube website and go to the Get Involved tab and, uh, and sign up to be a member of EarthCube. Um, now, I want to start off by just looking at uh, EarthCube as a community-led organization, uh, which has spun up some uh, uh, some actually organized uh, teams and committees that help it uh, uh, guide its workings. And uh, so uh, first we have a science standing committee that is tackling issues of science uh, uh, strategy for uh, the geosciences. And there's a technology and architecture committee which is uh, focused on, on what kinds of overarching uh, cyber infrastructure would be most valuable for, uh, for EarthCube. And then there's the Council of Data Facilities. Uh, if you're in an organization, an institution that's serving up data, uh, your institution can be a member of the Council of Data Facilities and they'll be working together. This is probably the first time that a lot of these NSF sponsored data providers uh, are working together to solve common issues with, uh, with uh, providing data. Um, and then we also have a couple of teams that are helping the community uh, work closer together. The engagement team is for uh, the EarthCube members to become more engaged once they're within EarthCube and get to know what's happening in EarthCube, and also to engage uh, the wider geosciences uh, groups to, uh, to join EarthCube. And the liaison team, um, which is uh, going to start probably more next year, uh, is for when EarthCube is ready to partner with other organizations. We know we're not the only, uh, you know, kid on the block here. Uh, there are lots of other organizations that have cyber infrastructure, that have data resources, that have software resources, and we don't want to reinvent anything. We, uh, we want to leverage what's out there and be a, a good partners to other organizations. Of course, supporting all this is the EarthCube community itself, the membership. And the membership uh, leads the organization and uh, has important vote on, uh, on the leadership council. Um, there are at-large um, members that are elected directly from the membership. Other members are uh, appointed from within these committees to, so that there's a, a science voice and a, and a cyber infrastructure voice and a data facility voice always on the leadership council. Um, and uh, once you become a member of EarthCube, you can volunteer to help out with any of these. Now, the science-funded teams never really worked as planned. Instead, uh, the funded projects and the research coordination networks like, like yours are simply going to be encouraged to work in the rest of the governance structure and specifically in working groups. Now, working groups are going to be where most of the activity of EarthCube happens. And there are already several working groups in, in both the architecture and the science side of things. So we encourage you to, uh, and these are always open to anyone who wants to join and, and, and step up. And if you see an issue, you want to lead a working group, you can do that too. Um, EarthCube has a vision, and I'm going to talk about uh, the vision in relationship to uh, to, to the process of, of, of geoscience. And one of the things at the very end of the, of the vision is this notion of open science. And now what is open science? And everyone has an idea of open science. And last fall uh, in Santa Barbara, the NSF funded a, an open science hackathon. And I don't know if any of you were there, but uh, there was a group of mostly early career people who are trying to outline exactly what open science is. And mostly open science happens at the end of the process right now. People have been focusing on opening up access to journal articles, opening up the data that go into journal articles. And 
this is the, the sort of the last step in open science. Kind of more interesting is what happens at the start of the process. What happens when you start sharing ideas and hypotheses and, and research designs and, and, and how that can open up, uh, you know, uh, new science and, and new ideas uh, across the geosciences. And then in the middle, this is something that the architecture committee is working on really, really hard is, uh, you know, promoting standards and, and open formats for, for data and middleware and uh, uh, workflows and uh, working on the whole reproducibility of the science process and the provenance of how data are used so that science can understand a lot more about how it works. Now, at the beginning of the month, um, in a webinar uh, for, for open data, um, or data one, I mean, um, Cameron Nalen uh, was talking about issues in the larger science realm. And he, he wanted to start off with, with Robert Boyle in the beginning of science. And, and what Robert Boyle faced was, was actually what he was. Robert Boyle was an alchemist. And so as an alchemist, he worked alone, and he, and he kept his own notes, and he, he didn't share. But at some point, he decided, well, this really isn't scaling well. This isn't working for us. Um, and so he and some friends started the Invisible College around Oxford, and, and they, they started to think about opening up alchemy um, and creating what, mostly what we now know as chemistry, uh, but also creating a scientific method, uh, which is based on sharing, sharing knowledge, sharing methods, reproducing experiments, having open demonstrations of, of uh, experiments, and sharing lots of things. Uh, if you look at the original proceedings of the Royal Society uh, from the 1660s, you see that uh, the, the natural philosophers were sharing all kinds of observations and ideas and hypotheses, and, and uh, um, it, it was really as open a discussion as you can imagine at the time. Of course, you know, all these people had enough money to be in it, so there was that too. Well, if that's what, what science is, I mean, why do we have all these issues now, and why are we pushing for open science? Isn't science already open? Now, Cameron Nalen makes a, an interesting point about scalability, and particularly in the 20th century, um, because during the 20th century, the population of, of scientists and, uh, and people in, in higher education increased about 10,000 percent, about a hundredfold. And this put a lot of pressure on those organizations that had been around in the 19th, sometimes the 18th century, um, and they really couldn't keep up, okay? So academic societies uh, didn't have enough pages in their journals for all this new science. And so uh, they, they basically handed this off to, uh, to the new for-profit science journals that we have now. And then peer review um, went from a fairly open process of exchanging criticism and, and uh, information about possible papers to something that was closed. And, uh, uh, and there's some impacts of that, too, that, that we still feel. Of course, we all know science funding has become more competitive and even more competitive in the last 20 years as uh, particularly state run universities face, uh, you know, legislatures, uh, they're guided by uh, neoliberal economics. And, uh, um, but at the same time, science methods also became more complex, and, uh, and the equipment became more complex, and, uh, and, and the processes in some ways have become more rivalrous than they, than they used to be. And, and part of that has to do with the competition for funding. And finally, the actual record of science. Okay, what you actually get in a journal article is much less a full record of the science that went into that article than it used to be. Um, and again, this is because we're still working with the idea of, of a scarcity of space for these articles. Now, here's another thing. I just want to take a little detour here. If you were a student, a grad student in 1968, you would not be asked to do uh, a poster at a poster session at a geoscience meeting because there were no poster sessions for any science meeting. By the early 70s, poster sessions were a feature of certain meetings 
and they were designed, and as we all know, for the overflow of people who were not able to give presentations. And you know what that led to? Okay, so we've all been there. But if you look at the larger picture globally about what science is doing with posters, it becomes a little bit problematic. Um, because right now there are more than a million science and engineering posters created every year. And the cost of this is something over $2 billion. And the expense, in some ways, to the science organization is about 40,000 person years of effort in any one year. But we do have the internet. And you have to ask, well, you know, why hasn't the internet done its job? And in some ways, it's even more a question because uh, there are people who claim that the internet was actually created to help facilitate science communication and disrupt scientific publishing. So what's, what's gone wrong? Now, I'm gonna say that part of the situation we have is, is the, the culture of sharing in science that was very strong in 1660 um, it's much less strong in uh, 2015. And, uh, and the science has become much more rivalrous than, than it used to be. And I'm not going to claim that Earth Cube is going to solve all that. And there are lots of crises in the academy uh, that we know about. There's crisis in tenure, and there's, you know, uh, issues of uh, gender discrimination. There are lots of things that Earth Cube is just not going to solve. But one of the things that Earth Cube can make us stake at is, is starting a new culture internally of sharing know-how. And there's a really good reason for this that, that's involved in open science as a process. Now, Cameron also uh, pointed to the, the economists divide up goods uh, into four different groups. It's whether you can exclude people from using them or not, you know, a paywall around a journal excludes certain people or whether it's rivalrous or non-rivalrous. Uh, rivalrous, rivalrous means that if I have it, you can't have it. If you have it, I can't have it. Um, and as I said, the end products of the scientific process uh, were given to uh, private, mostly uh, you know, um, for-profit publishers, and people sign away their copyright. And now what we're seeing is a, is a movement to extract those private goods and create public good. And that's gonna do a lot. But what it doesn't do is it, it takes away the profit capabilities that the private goods had, and it doesn't add the same kind of profit capability uh, with the public goods. And the public goods, all of these open access journal articles and uh, open repository data, um, are just sitting there now. And for them to really get used, you need to have a community or a club. This is the, what they call club goods in, in sort of classical economics. But I'm gonna call them community goods um, because for a club that has a very low threshold of, of, uh, of entry, all you have to do is sign up on the website. Of course, it helps if you have 12 or 16 years of education too, but um, so, but that community of, of, uh, of practice is what enables the common, all these new goods, to be usable, okay, by providing the cyber infrastructure that accesses them and, and providing the, the new knowledge of how to fit them into the scientific process that makes them valuable back to the community. So the community adds value to the common, and the commons adds its own value back to the community. Now, you're all scientists, right? And uh, which means at some point you decided not to be investment bankers. And I, I know your parents have, are still wrestling with that, but, but you have a tremendous amount of know-how and you bring that to EarthCube when you show up. And so any, any room, and I, I was at a science meeting uh, last week in Berkeley and there was a tremendous, uh, uh, meeting that, that went through and is drafting the whole uh, science strategy 
uh, for Earth Cube. And that's going to be a document that you can all look at and you'll all be able to uh, add your, your own ideas to that. Uh, so you bring something to the mix. Well, you need to get something from the mix. One of the issues with a, uh, a virtual organization or, or any club uh, that's made up of volunteers is that every volunteer who comes to the club should get more than they provide. And one of the things that EarthCube will do, that other groups do, but EarthCube is going to do it for the geosciences, and it's going to do it across domains, and it's going to do it between scientists and data scientists, is be a space where people who know things that you don't know um, are there, and you can talk to them, and they can see you, and uh, you can get into the listserv and send an email, and you can get into a, a working group and work with them. And this is the network effect that EarthCube is going to build over the next several years. And part of the value of that is that still today, um, you need people to tell you where to get the data that you're looking for. And so the know who uh, is the first step in knowing where things are right now. Now, I think the idea of, of building registries and, and other discovery tools uh, might make this no, uh, nowhere less of a no-who proposition. But, but right now, uh, people will tell you, you know, if you want to figure out where to get the best data, you have to know who to ask. And so uh, that's another effect of, uh, of EarthCube is, uh, is being able to find data. Another part of EarthCube is, is knowing why uh, you're doing science in a way, in Earth Cube. And that's where the vision statement is more than a vision statement. It has to be sort of a driving force for Earth Cube, and it has to be this open, contestable, celebrated idea that, that is shared among uh, the members of Earth Cube. And uh, that's another part of, of Earth Cube governance and community that we hope to build. And finally, it would be great if Earth Cube could be the place or the geosciences uh, really get to discover what geoscience knows in a broader sense. It, it's a place that, uh, that the, where the, the information, the latest uh, results, um, the deep data mining from the commons, um, and, and the synthetic uh, capabilities of all of those open access journal articles uh, can be uh, found and discussed, and, and science can accelerate um, and transform itself uh, for the next generation. So I just want to say thank you again, um, and I hope that uh, everyone on the call will consider getting involved in EarthCube. And one of the things that we are looking for is we have an all-hands meeting at the end of May. You can go to the website and, uh, and check it out. And we are looking for breakout sessions uh, on topics of, of interest to the community. Um, and I know that your, uh, your group will also have a, a capability uh, to do a, a demonstration in a showcase, I believe. So you'll be having that too. So I hope to see you all in Arlington in May. Thank you. Bruce, thank you for that very interesting presentation. I hope we will get many questions about it in the chat window, but I have a few here to start off with. Um, are you targeting any aspects of EarthCube uh, to particularly work on encouraging open science? You did mention building the infrastructure, but how about the social aspects that need to be worked on? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's very much, you know, why I'm the sort of Provo employee at EarthCube. I'm the only, only one who's, uh, who's actually employed as an EarthCube person now. And I'm, I'm very interested in the, what I call cyber social structure. Um, the social side, uh, of, of these organizations in, involves, you know, facilitating, 
um, as much interpersonal work as we can and uh, having the best meeting possible um, so when people show up for a face-to-face -face meeting um, they, they leave uh, you know with a lot of benefit from from actually being there um, and uh, you know the social side uh, if, if the Eastern Federation which I've worked in for a number of years is an example the social side takes a few years to develop because there's a trust element in there um, but I think the more we talk about how open science uh, requires uh, sharing and the more we can push the open science up into the beginning parts of the scientific process uh, the, the more open science will build because uh, if if the end point is closed, there, there's a point down the road where you have to give the intellectual property to someone else. You can't open it up behind that. Um, so uh, we need to open it up as soon as we can. Okay. Um, the next question is, you mentioned the all hands meeting. What do you think are the ideal outcomes from such a meeting? Well, this is the first all hands meeting where uh, we're not building a, a future earth cube. So what I'd like to see at this meeting is a cross fertilization between the science side of earth cube and the uh, technical architecture side of earth cube and a real conversation that, uh, uh, that will last, uh, you know, throughout the next year. Um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, of work being done to sort of build the document that will be guiding EarthCube, and these have to be interrogated too. But, um, you know, each meeting, it just has to be successful on its own. I, we're not going to build anything out of, off of just one meeting. Um, it took the East Federation about seven years to find its feet. Um, and uh, so it will take a while for EarthCube to become a spot in, in everyone's calendar. And I think we can start with this meeting and see where we go. Okay. Um, you also mentioned that, uh, well, we see that EarthCube is evolving and more projects are being added on as it evolves. What do you think are the biggest challenges as EarthCube keeps on expanding and evolving? Well, the, the projects uh, that are funded are sometimes funded as experiments. And so one challenge is that not all of them are going to offer, uh, you know, uh, products that are, uh, that will remain useful, although the knowledge that they put into making the product will be useful. Um, on the other side, the research coordination networks, I think, are really important, and I think it, it, it's challenging for EarthCube to absorb these after they're stopped being funded and, and keep supporting them to grow uh, within EarthCube. Uh, we're going to have to work with the NSF for the funds to do that. I'm sure that's a very popular sentiment among the C4P um, members and participants. Great to hear that. Okay, so are there any more questions? Let me scroll down. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions at this time, but as we said, both of these presentations will be archived, both at the EarthCube website and at the C4P YouTube channel. And I'd like to say thank you again to both of the presenters today for their presentations. And lastly, for future webinars, which I believe there are two more this spring series, please check out the schedule at the earthcube.org site. Thanks for attending and hope to see you at a future webinar. Thanks, everybody.